you have a tiny amount of DNA or RNA that you're trying to like precipitate out of a tube, it can be really hard to see. So what you're gonna do? Use glyco blue. Glycogen blue is a co-precipitant or a carrier. And what it does is it helps carry precipitated nucleic acids, so DNA or RNA, out of a solution, such as when you're trying to purify them using some sort of like ethanol, salt ethanol precipitation. It's kind of like if you've ever tried to like sweep up a floor and there's a bunch of like fine dust everywhere, it's gonna be, you might not even see that dust exists, um, but then you try to like sweep it up and maybe your broom like just like goes over the surface and it's not actually very, very productive at sweeping it, but you try to sweep it into a pile and you can barely see the pile. Well, if what if you added like bigger st stuff all over the floor? Well, now when you go to sweep it up, not only is your pile going to be a lot bigger and easier to see, but it's also going to kind of like drag stuff with it. Um, drag those little particles, um, those little dust um, mites and stuff. And so then what's going to happen is that you end up with this big clump of stuff, including that tiny little stuff, um, and you're actually able to see it. Um, and so this is the idea behind glycogen blue, um, as well as other co-precipitants like LPA um, and yeast tRNA and stuff like that, is that it's going to help you um, bring out a solution um, and bring like make it so that you can pull down with the centrifuge precipitated DNA and RNA um, and actually be able to see your pellet when you're using this glyco blue which has a dye attached to that glycogen. So glycogen is the storage form of glucose that we use in our body. So glucose is blood sugar um, and it has these like individual sugar units and these can all just be like hanging around in your cells but that would be kind of well, you'd have all these like random things hanging out like all over the place. It would mess with osmolarity, all this other complicated stuff I'm not gonna get into, but it doesn't make sense to keep just those individual storage units hanging around um, for a rainy day. Instead, you want to keep like a, keep it all like a stock of it in one place where then you can take some when you need it. Um, so it's kind of like, give me a break, give me a break, break me off a piece of that glycogen. So when your body needs um, glucose, when it needs blood sugar, your liver and stuff sends out all these hormones and then you start breaking down this glycogen. So taking this like branched glucose network and taking pieces off um, and then using them. And so because you have this big branch glucose thing, um, well, this is going to be good at helping like glob onto the DNA and RNA and coming out a solution because it's not going to be soluble in um, in these alcohols. And so it's going to help um, bring things out. Just a quick overview of how this purification works is that you are going to use ethanol or isopropanol, um, some sort of alcohol in combination with salt to help make DNA and RNA not soluble. Um, and so DNA and RNA are soluble in water, but they're not so soluble in these alcohols, especially when there's salt around. What's going to happen is that DNA and RNA have this negatively charged backbone, thanks to those phosphate groups. Now this backbone, this negative charge, is part of why it likes to hang out with water, because water is what we call polar. It has partial hot, positive parts and partial negative parts. And this is going to, like those positive parts are gonna to wanna to hang out with the negative charged backbone. And so what's gonna happen is that the water is going to surround them and when this happens, we say it's dissolved. Well, now what happens if you add salt? So salt, say your typical table salt, sodium chloride. When you add the salt, when you dissolve um, the salt, it actually dissociates, so it comes apart into sodium and chloride ions. Those positively charged sodium ions are actually going to then bind to the backbone of the DNA or RNA, if they can find it. In the case of water, the water is surrounding the DNA and RNA so that the salt ions can't find it. So we need to hide, um, we need to like get that water away. And we can do that by switching to a solvent like ethanol or isopropanol. These have a lower, what we call dielectric constant. They're less polar. It's kind of like if you had two, think about two magnets separated and then you put some sheets of paper in, in between them. This is kind of like shielding the magnets charges from one another. And this is kind of what water does. It hides those charges from one another. And so even though the salt and the DNA and RNA backbone want to hang out, um, then they can't because the water's in the way. If you take those sheets of paper away, now they can see each other. And this is like using a lower dielectric solvent, um, such as um, ethanol or isopropanol. It allows those charges to see each other. When they see each other, they come to bind together. Then they're neutral. And now the water really doesn't want to hang out with them because they're neutral and water has those charged charges. And so they're going to precipitate or come out a solution. 
Now the problem is actually isolating all those tiny little bits that are like suspended all around the liquid, and this is where the centrifugation pull comes into play in order to pull those things out. But in order to pull them out, the centri there needs to be enough of like a mass, there needs to be a big enough size so that the centrifuge can overcome the forces that are acting against it. So things like buoyancy, things like the water around those chunks, um, around those pieces that's like then interacting with other water molecules, you need those little pieces to come together. Um, and this cool term called flocculation describes how these pieces, like these little stuff can come together to make bigger stuff. And then that bigger stuff is going to be easier to pull it out. And we can get these to help come together by using a coprecipitant, by using something like glycogen or LPA, um, linear polyacrylamide polyacrylamide or like TNA and stuff like this, this is going to allow us to help bring those little pieces together and pull them out of the solution to help us sweep together all of this little stuff into a form that we can hopefully visualize if we use the dyed version, it's a lot easier, um, and that then we can pipette or aspirate or pour off all that other liquid um, and do some further washes and stuff in order to end up with pure nucleic acid. So even if you get it to come out of solution, it might, and you get it to centrifuge out so you're able to pull off all that liquid, you still might be left with a teeny tiny little pellet. So hopefully you've oriented your tubes um, so that you know where the pellet will be. So if it's in a fixed angle centrifuge, your pellet is going to be on the up outer corner. Um, and you can mark. It's helpful to put your tube in the orientation where like I always put it so that the cap's facing out so that I know exactly where to put where the pellet will be and when it comes out you can kind of mark it but it can still be hard to see. What can be helpful is if you add um, glyco blue. This has a blue dye conjugated or like directly bound to this glycogen um, and this is going to allow it so that you can actually visualize that pellet once it pellets. Um, this is especially helpful too because when you're in one of these fixed angles, instead of going directly to the bottom, you can have stuff kind of like on the side of the tube and you might get these blue specks that are, um, would be hard to, you would probably scrape off or something if it wasn't, um, if it wasn't dyed blue. Much more on this in my pesky pellet post, um, but when you're actually um, aspirating off, so taking off that liquid, be really careful not to disrupt that pellet. Um, so start with like a P1000 to get most of it off um, and then take a smaller pipette like a P200 or a P20 um, and get the last remaining stuff. Um, when your other tubes, when you're waiting, like do one at a time and keep the other ones in the centrifuge at the angle that they're at um, so that that pellet doesn't start like resolubilizing and like getting all funky um, and so it stays in its place. Um, so and then keep the, so keep them in the centrifuge and then you're taking yours out. And typically you're doing the centrifugations um, with the refrigerated centrifuge at like four degrees Celsius. So when you get that pellet, then you can pipette off all that liquid um, and you're left with this like little pellet. And then typically what you do is like a wash with like 80% ethanol or something so that some of the salts can come off but not the DNA and the RNA which is still stuck on there. Um, but eventually you're gonna wanna like resuspend the pellet so actually get it to undissolve. Um, and when you do this, um, a little trick is you can actually like play the xylophone with your tube, um, so like scrape it against the bottom. And this is going to help the pellet kind of like resuspend, um, and then you won't be able to see the blue as much. Um, speaking of which, but at that point you want to suspend it. But basically, a good thing about glycogen and glyco blue, um, the dye doesn't really mess with anything, is that it um, is like inert, so it's not going to mess up with things that you're doing downstream. If you want to do like PCR, if you want to do sequencing library prep, if you want to do I don't know, whatever the heck you want to do with your DNA or RNA, you want to do something with it, then the glycogen is, hope, is probably not going to um, interfere with that. Plus, you're, it's not like you're using things like as concentrated as when you put the glycogen blue in there. Um, so you're going to be like resuspending it in some sort of liquid and then you take a tiny bit of that and then it's going to be in a much larger volume and that glyco blue is going to get like diluted out. Um, and so it's not like you're going to have a ton, a ton of stuff in there that's going to be interfering. Speaking of interfering, other co-precipitants can be used, such as like yeast TR tRNAs. Um, and so again, it's the same sort of idea that it's helping act as kind of like lobbing onto that stuff, making it bigger, kind of helping swoop it up together. Um, but in that case, since you're actually adding RNA, well now if you go and you take your purified RNA and you go to measure how much RNA you have, well, you're gonna have a ton. Um, but yeah, that's gonna be the yeast RNA. At least a large proportion of it um, is going to be the yeast RNA.
So to use black and blue is really simple. Um, so basically you just take your solution um, where you've had added your salts and your ethanol, your isopropanol, and you add glycol blue. Um, so typically it's like a uh, one to 300 ratio or something you want about to end up with about 50 micrograms per mil. Um, and um, you can use less if you have longer DNA or RNA, which already is gonna be more massive and so have, doesn't need as much help precipitating out, but for that smaller stuff, you wanna use a higher concentration. Um, and it's going to really help pull things out. Um, and then, yeah, you just add it, and then when you spin it down, your pellet is going to be blue, and hopefully it's not just a bunch of glycogen in there, but it is your DNA or RNA, too.